Welcome back. It's your boy Nistro, and we are here discussing what happened this at YCS Richmond. And because I didn't talk about it earlier, we're also going to discuss a little bit about YCS Indianapolis because looking at both events, we get to see what has Age of Overlord really done to Yu-Gi-Oh! And there's a few big macro points of like, okay, how has it power crept the game and how has the format handled the new cards that came in Age of Overlord? First off, most of the Nightmare Links are like power crept because of cards like SP Little Knight. It's a staple. In just about every deck of the format, there's there's no deck that like can't use SP Little Knight in some way, shape, or form. Even a single copy. Some decks needing two, like Infernoble and Rescue Ace needs two on top of needing expensive engines like Dia Bellstar um, and the Sinful Spoils package. We also saw a lot of Superstellar Sky Crisis, I believe he's called in uh, TCG. And that card has just been a great going second card to like mitigate your opponent's field and kind of break more things down going second also its ability to stop cards like baron and zeus from activating on summon because it's continuous is great we love to see it and it's been a very good card for the format i think a healthy card for the format it's it's like it's more of like a band-aid than it is like problem so that's kind of been good and the abundance of Simple spoils decks has uh, come to fruition. We're seeing Rescue Ace, at least in Indiana in Indianapolis, was like the most dominating deck, but now people are starting to side for it. And if you look at this uh, pie chart over here, it looks like now that people know that Rescue Ace is a threat, it's not going to do as well because people are, are prepared for it. Despite that, even though people are prepared for it, it did still hit the top tables. It didn't hit top four, Unchained put in a lot of work this event. I think a lot of people kind of forgetting about Unchained as a deck. People thought maybe they, they thought Unchained was already solved, so they probably didn't play as many answers for it or they weren't as prepared for it. And Unchained kind of blew it out the water. Unchained getting four of, of the top eight and then ended up being a Unchained mirror match as the final round of this event was actually really cool. The same way that two weeks ago, it was a Rescue Ace mirror match in for, for the final round. Two elements are still doing, still holding strong. I heard some people say that Horus wasn't a good solution for the deck, but it seemed to do well for that guy who got to top eight <laughs> with it. And we're gonna go more into that later. Also, funny enough, it was the same guy that got beaten by the Exodia player, so that was kind of funny. And then Infernoble, how could we forget Infernoble pack this weekend kind of like blew it out the water. He had two different feature matches where he played Infernoble really skillfully. Like, there were things that he was doing with Infernoble and Dia Bellstar that I was not even considering as like possible like though the way that pack had kind of taken a deck like infernoble that has been considered sort of like a streamlined rogue deck you know like a streamlined uh combo combo routes uh, or telegraphed that's the proper word with telegraph combos and stuff and it's seemingly very vulnerable to hand traps like droll and nib now it's like with the sinful spoils package you kind of get to play around with your food a lot more. You get to make more cards that break down your opponent's board. It's not just, you know, summon one, summon two, going to to Isold. Now it is SP Little Knight into this, into that, into Angelica, and then like really late in the turn, that's when you some like we that's when we saw him summon Isold when he needed the, those extra resources and. The ability for the deck to be varied in its combo structure has allowed it to uh, get all the way to the top tables because now it's like the answers to a deck like Infernoble really aren't that obvious. As a matter of fact, the cards that beat Infernoble are the complete opposite of the cards that beat Rescue Ace because Infernoble does does not lose to uh, back row removal. It doesn't lose to Evenly. It doesn't lose to Lightning Storm. It doesn't lose to a lot of things like that because Infernoble, they end on like at least three or four spell negates, you know, with the double Charles, a Baron potentially, and potentially even Angelic Ring on top of that, that's already four cards that could negate spells or traps. And then you, you know, Rescue Ace usually doesn't end on any spell and trap negates unless you're Steven and you're playing the Terahertz build, which I think is amazing. If you're on the, or if you're on the Synchro build, which you play a, a few more bricks, but you get a higher ceiling. Both builds have their merits, but uh, I believe if you're not on one of those two builds, I, I just don't know what to tell you. Like you are playing into Rescue Ace's flaws really heavily. People always say like, hey, you know, you can, 
it doesn't matter if you get even lead, you can still play around with like impulse. But then I see people cutting impulse. So it's like, it's kind of weird. Like I see people saying like, oh, well the deck doesn't need spell and trap negates with like Terra Hertz or with a uh, synchro package because you can play with, you know, your hand traps if you get even lead or lightning stormed. But then they're also cutting impulse and they're cutting fire engine and they're cutting these like utility cards for the opponent's turn. So I'm kind of just not too sure like what some people are doing with Rescue Ace, but Steven made it to top eight after making it to first place the last YCS. So I know that there's a lot more to be figured out. The, the, the format is very open. And so there's probably gonna be a lot of games where you're not gonna know what deck you're going into. And that's probably gonna cause a lot of decks that like maybe aren't too used to having versatile matchups to not be as successful in this um, event. In an open format, I promise you, you're not playing any spawn trap negates, you're gonna lose to some random shit. You're gonna lose to some random fucking shit if you don't have spell and trap negates in your deck, or at least ways to play around them. Unchained at least has a lot of ways to deal with things. You like a card like Wave King Caesar deals with a lot. And the fact it's not once per turn, it deals with like adventure token, it deals with um it pretty much like single-handedly beats Pearly if it, you know, stays on field and tier elements as well it's very hard for tier elements to like make a board if wave king caesar's on board i can definitely see why unchained got to the top of the ranks in this tournament labyrinth i'm i'm happy it's still around i know when cash Jira was was at the peak uh, labyrinth kind of struggled to stay in the format because they could they couldn't do too much um about rise heart because the more that i learn about labyrinth the more that i learned that you know they kind of need their graveyard to like res they they kind of just play out their grave like their their set cards are very important but what what keeps them in the game is their ability to recycle things from the graveyard like their their welcome labyrinths and their um and their hand traps like the um I I ikea furniture cards keep them in the games and pearly i it's still a pretty strong deck i'm still like kind of surprised because it's kind of like a blowout deck against like rogue matchups and against people that like or against like certain i guess decks are like less prepared for it so i can see why it, it can still make it to the top tables despite having a very streamlined game plan or a very telegraph game plan and now pearly players are even like countering the counters. Uh, they're starting to find ways to play around Herald of the Abyss and stuff like that. So we're gonna get a little more into that once we get through some of the profiles, but uh, there's the um, overview of the meta at the moment, or at least of this event at the moment, right? Uh, we don't see much Dragon Link here. I think Dragon Link still has potential. There, there are a lot of decks that still have potential that we just don't see in these um, top tables, but it is what it is, right? For example, there's a Dynamorphia list that made it to, to the top. I don't think it's pure Dynamorphia. I think it was that Dynamorphia Exosister mix that like made it all the way to the top. Also, Makonko is still a pretty good deck. People kind of sleep on it. They don't, if you don't read Makonko cards, you are going to lose the game because they will be inflicting like two, 3000 damage per attack. Even when you have a board full of monsters, if you don't know how to play around some of their cards. So just be really careful about that. And we also saw Salamangrate make it to um, top 32. We saw Patrick Hopin with Manadium. And we saw Triff make it all the way to top four with uh, Manadium in YCS Indianapolis. And he, he even um, had a feature match, which although he had a really terrible opponent, it was still a really good match to showcase the potential of what Manadium can do when in terms of like playing around boards. We're going to go into some of the lists now with Unchained. Uh, there's, you know, it's first and it's second place. So I, I think like the best thing we can do is just to compare the first and second place lists and see like what the differences are. And so first off, uh, first place is, you know, he, he's on tour guide. I remember tour guide used to be like a big debate in the, um, unchained community. Now it seems to be like a consensus that tour guide is necessary. Uh, the, the DDD package is here. He's on single triple tactics in main singles of each prosperity. He's on Machinex, which is a decent card. Phantasmi inside, Mistaken Arrest in the side deck, which I'm a little surprised about. Like, this is like Droll Super Sand, you know? It's like you can do all your searching and then activate this during your, like, like after you're done with everything, and then your opponent would not be able to search. So it's a really good blowout card going first. It's like better than Droll in some ways, and it's like it's hard, it's really hard to like interact with because it's a quick play spell card until the end of your next turn after this card resolves cards cannot be added from either player's main deck to the hand except by drawing them 
Unchained really does not need to add cards from deck to hand. Unchained can can play popping their their sets and stuff so that they're summoning rather than searching. It's not like they draw, but I can definitely see why a card like Mistaken Arrest going first can stop your opponent from just playing the game altogether. <laughs> Start bringing out your Cyframe gear uh, deltas. Since this is now the tech that made it to first place, this might be a card that more people start using. Uh, single Herald of the Abyss and uh, Triple Tactics in the side, so maybe against Pearly. You side in that second copy of uh, Tactics Dressed, and you also side in the Herald of the Abyss. Just so um, if they use Nor once, you pretty much have the answer for it. But now, as I said, Pearly have started developing an answer to Herald of the Abyss, so, and we're going to get a little more into that later. Uh, second place, they're not on the Machin X, but they are on Underworld Goddess. It seems kind of funny to me that like most people would be on Underworld God, or like I would assume more people would be on Underworld Goddess in this format because if you're trying to beat Rescue Ace, the best way to beat Rescue Ace is to summon cards that can't be targeted. Like non-targetable cards, Unchained normally has an issue dealing with untargetable cards as well, unless you have like something like Herald of the Abyss to deal with it because most of their cards target for removal, other than like Unchained Soul, but if you have a card that like can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects, Battle is really the only way that you can handle it, and if it's something like a Chaos Angel, which also cannot be destroyed by battle, then Underworld Goddess is your only answer. I can definitely see why Underworld Goddess is here. I don't understand why they chose Machinex over Underworld Goddess. Maybe Machinex does um, uh, its ability to like absorb materials is uh, way more effective. Lightning Storms in the side, uh, Bestials in the side, Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood. Kind of a funny card for time, but we saw there was a top 32 Kashtira list that I forgot to mention when going down. That someone did top of Kashtira. He's a member of Ground Game. Uh, the deck profile is on the Ground Game channel if you guys haven't checked it out already. And he said Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood did nothing for him all weekend. That the card isn't as great as it seems. So it's definitely understandable why like some people may not think this card is worth playing but it still is a good card, I think, for, for time and stuff. So I can understand why people would play it. The Triple Druus Worm, and this guy on second place was on the um, Unchained Soul of Disaster, which we don't see a lot of Unchained players use, but like for breaking boards and for like extending through interruptions, I think this may be a great card to consider. If, if you're playing against some rogue shit and they end on like way too many interruptions, this is a great way to deal with it. Um, also, their ratio of the tactics is one, Talents Triple Thrust and one Herald of the Abyss, which I think is more like synonymous with how I think Thrust should be played this format because Thrust is more important than Talents, especially in a deck like Unchained where you can like pop your sets. I think Thrust is definitely a, a lot more important. We see him on Triple Fenrir. We don't really see uh, first place on Fenrir. We see him, but he's not on the Dark Contract package. He's like trading Dark Contract for Fenrir. And also his list is at 40. It seems to be a more like tighter list. And one thing you're gonna notice about a lot of the decks that top this format is that not a lot of them are at 40. You know, like 43, 44, 42. People have kind of ditched the whole 40 card mindset because there's a lot that you need to pack into your deck this format because you're going to be facing a lot of different decks. So you wanna have those cards for those fringe situations situations and you also want to be able to fit as much engine for recursion and for grind games as, as possible as well because you don't want to lose to the fact that you don't have more steam in your deck you know you want to be able to keep playing so avoiding playing single copy ratios of those cards that like may not be as important because the format's so diverse playing over 40 cards seems to be the right call here so now we're going on to third place, Pack with his Sinful Spool's Infernoble deck. And first off, what you'll notice is that he's only playing single copies of every Infernoble name. Only one Gearfried, only one uh, Red Layer, only one Fire Flint. He's only on a single copy of Dia Star, which I think is uh, kind of funny because now Wanted Poster is going up to like 70 bucks, but Dia Star is like stay staying the same price because you really don't need that many of her. But the brilliant thing about Infernoble mixed with Sinful Spoils is now like you don't really go minus for resolving Dia Star. You don't go minus for resolving original Sinful Spoils. You can send face up cards you control to, to activate both the Abel Star and the original Simple Spoils, meaning if you have like just some random equips like Phoenix Blade or Durandal that's you that you've already used the effect of this turn, then you can just you can just send it to Grave for the activation of uh, the Abel Star and original Simple Spoils, and now you've effectively have not went neg to resolve this card, and 
That was my issue with the wanted package in Rescue Ace was that it felt like you're going minus just to resolve it. It's a great starting engine, don't get me wrong, but when you already open stuff like Airlifter, it kind of feels like redundant. It's like, why am I going minus just to play this stuff? It just... It's only because of the draw off of Wanted Poster that it all seems worth it. But now, with Infernoble, it's like you're not going Midas at all. You pretty much just get to play it. Like, you can send a face-up museum whose effects you've already used. It's kind of nutty. It, it may seem like, well, he's not on that many warrior monsters. How is he making a lot of these links and these Esolds consistently first turn? And I'll tell you what, it's actually a lot more consistent than it seems because... As you probably know by now, uh, Sinful Spoils can get any level 1 fire monster from deck. Meaning that instead of just having um, single copies of these um, Infernoble monsters and Fireflint Lady, he now has about, I, and, and I counted this like twice, he has about like 17 ways to get access into any level 1 fire warrior in this deck. Meaning all he has to do is draw a single warrior monster. He doesn't have to draw one, I mean he doesn't have to draw two, he doesn't have to draw multiples. He just has to get a single fire warrior or a single warrior monster in, in his opening hand. Like any one of these warrior monsters will do and any one of these extenders will help him get to, to something that actually extends his combo. It's a really consistent deck because you don't have to open a particular set of Infernoble monsters because of all these searching cards, you can get any other warrior in your deck, which allows you to extend like crazy when you do open like the best warrior like Neo Space Connector and you get to see your opponent's hand and gets to see stuff like uh, like you get hand knowledge, you get hand trap knowledge, you get matchup knowledge and you know which end board you should make. The fact that you and you know whether you should end on Double Charles, Baron or Apo or SP Little Knight, you will get all that knowledge potentially by looking at their hand with um, Aqua Dolphin. So it's kind of like best case scenario if you open Connector, but you're really not that bad off if you don't open it either it's really interesting how this deck has kind of like come together to create this like really consistent mix of engines that plays through a lot of fucking shit because you have so much gas once you start going off and this is why i didn't like have us getting started with infernoble video because even before age of overlord with the dml star stuff i'm like dude there's just so many routes and combos with this deck for me to learn and then for me to not to play the deck competitively. And before I kind of like shoved it off because I'm like, well, I don't want to learn all this shit for the deck just to lose to hand traps. But then um, after seeing this, I'm a little more inspired, a little more motivated to give this deck a shot. Um, it's really interesting, you know, it's like he got like Link Spider for the, um, in case he gets nibbed, like he gets to turn Link Spider and any other monster into like a SP Little Knight. Um, you, you see Anima, not just because of uh, you're playing multiple level ones, but because all, all, um, Oliver can also make itself level one, and you can use this to sort of like play around going second, and then make SP Little Knight to break two cards on field instead of just one. And yeah, like now the limitations of like Museum only locking you into Warriors was kind of an issue before because it was like, well, if you can't get to Baron or like Double Charles, then you're kind of screwed. But now with SP Little Knight, it's not even a big deal if you can't make if you get locked into warriors it's like there's only two non-warrior cards in his extra deck <laughs> and these two were situational the the sky crisis and link spider are extremely situational anima is only for going second and apple is like in case you feel like you need the extra protection against um hand traps and such so most of the time he's not even worried about the warrior restriction because it doesn't really apply to him it's like how cyber decks play mostly cybers cards because uh, Transcode says you can't summon Cybers for the turn. It's like, great, I just won't play any non Cybers cards then. And it kind of just works for them. You take a look at the side deck, we see Fenrir into Riseheart, which is actually an amazing side side in for going second because now you get to have this, this starter that not only can disrupt stuff that your opponent does and break their board down, but also searches you a Fire Warrior. And once you get access to a single Fire Warrior without even using your Rota, in a sense. And because it's a level four fire, if you summon Ricardo, you can still make Angelica. You, if you summon Renaud, you can still make uh, Isold, and then you can start to go into your like real combos from there with like Ogier and Turpin and Magus. And the amount of times he resolved Magus in like a single match was absolutely insane. I completely underestimated the the utility of this card. I know in the replay I was talking about like it had a it had a condition. It, it, it the 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 condition wasn't actually its timing. The condition was. It couldn't recycle 
extra deck monsters because it sends cards back into deck for cost. Because it sends cards back into deck for cost, they have to be able to be returned into the main deck. So because of that, you cannot recycle your like Angelica and stuff, but Renaud can recycle all that shit anyway. So it's not even like it's a big deal if Magus can't recycle it. Magus can recycle, you know, multiple copies of your Noble Arms and stuff. So you don't have to be on too many of them. So that's why I, I was kind of right in predicting that he wouldn't be on Joy Use, but I wasn't on the nose as to the reason why. Now we know the reason why he's not on Joy Use because he has recursion anyway. He has crazy amounts of recursion anyway. And I, I'm not too sure if Magus can recycle Noble Arms Museum. We see him also on, on the triple crossout. So crossout kind of has like a double use here. Obviously it's a stop cards like Droll, right? Droll is like the biggest weakness for this deck because look at how many cards he said he has that says search on them. <laughs> he's not even on called by in vain. He's on called by inside. Like he has to confirm his opponent is on the hand trap before he actually starts playing with the called by and the cross outs and then he starts to go hard against them. So cross out is not just to stop the hand traps, which is, you know, the most obvious one, but it's also to stop decks like Pearly. So to stop the Pearly and to stop them from summoning their Nor during your turn is actually insane because now you effectively just kill Pearly's turn or kill the whole strength of the deck if they can't make Nor. If they can't make Nor, Pearly doesn't do that much. Like Nor is the reason why the deck actually can do something. So it's really interesting to see like most people's answers were something like Thrust into Herald of the Abyss and Pack isn't even on any Thrust, any Triple Tactics Talent, he's not on Prosperity. He doesn't need any of those consistency cards because the deck's already consistent enough. He draws cards with like Magus. He could resolve this the first turn that it's sent to Graveyard because it's very easy to mill it off of Ogier or off of like Angelica. It's really easy to mill it. Now you kind of have this card uh, cross out that's like a one card, one size fits all kind of card that can deal with just about any, just about any hand trap on top of dealing with certain matchups. It can deal with uh, Rescue Ace because he, it can just banish another copy of Wanted Poster if your opponent tries to Wanted Poster you to search their own uh, Diabelle Star. So it's actually like kind of interesting how much utility he gets off of Crossout for playing a lot of the same cards that other people would be using in their decks. As, as I said, this is like a masterclass in Infernoble. This is like the probably the best that Infernoble will ever be. Once, you know, because eventually this wanted poster shit's gonna get hit. We all know the simple spoil shit's gonna get hit, you know, eventually. But for right now, I think Infernoble is at like the peak of its um, competitive ability. It has not been this good since Goblin Thief Equip Spell was in the format, you know, like, and that was like, what, like 2019, like uh, three, four years ago. It had Calc into Aurora Dawn, into all that stupid shit. So, Infernoble so back. Um, I'm not gonna talk about Chris LeBanc too much. If, if, if you know who he is, you know why I don't wanna uh, mention him too much, but um, oh, he's not even on the Dark Lord, so I don't even care. Uh, pretty standard list, again, over 40. Um, Econ's in the side. Um, Econ has been good for like breaking boards and stuff now. A lot of people are on it. Um, a lot of combo decks are on it. I don't see many control decks on it, but I, I see a lot of combo decks on it. Um, summon limit, I guess, funny card, shifter, cool. I, I'm a little surprised that he's playing shifter. I'm, I thought Pearly lost hard to shifter, but hey, you know, whatever works for him, right? Otherwise, I, I don't I don't care about his list too much. Now, uh, Horus Tier Limits. And I'm really glad that people started playing Horus now, and then they started to realize that you don't need all the Horus cards. You just really need Impsity plus one more. Um, and that could either be Happy or that can be Dombi Tef. The Earth one, I don't think it's worth running unless you're playing like a pure Horus deck. Or you really need those level eights. <laughs> but we're seeing the Horus package in tier limits. The, the, the list otherwise looks pretty standard. We're seeing two Diviners, so that leaves them at six normal, uh, five normal summons. Some people are only on two Rhino Heart instead of three. Uh, Justin over here chose three uh, Double Diviner. He's not on Distrude or anything, so I think the only way he makes Baron is like Diviner plus a level four, if I'm not mistaken, because it doesn't look like he has any other tuners. Also, if Diviner gets negated or um, or something like that, and you just ha happen to have a Horus card sitting around, you can just hard sink a Horus plus a Diviner. And we see him on Trivi Karma. He's only on Double King Sarcophagus. And I think it's kind of funny. He's not on like Barricade Board Blocker, where like in case he mills one, he gets to discard one to add it back for like next turn. He's like, if I mill these King Sarcophaguses, that's, that's fine. That's it. 
I'm, I'm not going to care too much about this Horus package. Otherwise, you know, um, I, I believe Horus is a very, like, high-risk, high-reward kind of strategy. Um, when it comes to drawing, like, um... When it comes to drawing Impsity, because Impsity is, like, drop to add to. And any card that's drop to add to is a very high-risk strategy because it's so easy to ash it. It's, like, the easiest ash target in, like, Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, when it's, like... Oh, your opponent has lost is going to lose two cards in hand if you activate Ash Blossom right now, you know? <laughs> so Yeah. But otherwise it, it if if it resolves, it's really it's really great because you draw a card and only and now you only need to discard one more for for King Sarcophagus to get its full effect you to, to get happy and grave and then to get two level eights on board, which is great. And the only uh, rank 8 that we see him playing is Zombie Vampire for, like, the extra mills. We also start seeing this, um, this rank 6 here. It does a lot with the opponent's graveyard. It gains, like, a thousand for, like, each something in a graveyard. Or it, it gains, a, like, a hundred for each card in the graveyard, I believe. And then it, 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 um, can interact with the opponent's graveyard. Like, it can banish cards from the opponent's graveyard, or it can special summon the monsters from the opponent's graveyard. Something of that nature. So that's pretty cool. Um... We also see him on Super Polys and Main. We don't see any Guilty Gear Freed, but like this, the very simple Mud Dragon Garua uh, package can probably get a lot of, um, uh, probably can deal with like a lot of different boards still. Some people don't feel like Mud Dragon or Garua is enough. It doesn't deal with enough boards, but uh, you know, because it's tier limits, you kind of don't need the Super Poly. Super Poly is kind of just here to help you go second rather than to, um, rather than to deal with the negates themselves. So it, it's kind of like a, a, a double a, a double plus for the tier player if like Super Poly actually fucking resolves. You know, our tournaments kind of need the fusions just to keep playing. So if they can make the fusions easier, then is what it is. Also kind of interesting, no instant fusion for Mud Dragon. I guess he's a lot more confident in Super Poly. And I guess you don't want an instant fusion and super poly in, in the same hand because then you have to choose between like potentially losing the ability to break a board and then still have instant fusion be live. So I can understand why potentially you may not be in this list. I would say you can at least side it, you know, like you can at least side the super polys, maybe keep in like the tactics and stuff. And we see him on scatter shot inside for time. We see him on heartbeat for back or removal evenly for going second with the uh, thrust no herald of the abyss but i guess it's not necessary and here we are with steven santoli's uh sinful spoils rescue ace we're seeing him on econs i i think um book of moon has kind of started to fall out in uh popularity uh post age of overlord more people are sticking with their um enemy controllers over book of moon because it just seems more efficient to like steal your opponent's monsters than it does to um protect your own so that's why more people are on enemy controller now. Um, if you watch Steven San Santoli's deck profile, he kind of starts to talk about uh, a little bit about how the, the the extra deck really doesn't need a lot because you you can deal with a lot of things with your, with just your main deck. You don't need your extra deck to deal with a lot of stuff, and that's kind of what you have the double SP for because SP and access code can kind of just deal with everything. Otherwise, you're just going in, in, into Terra Hertz. Terra Hertz is great into the mirror match because negating a spell and trap. Basically, getting two interruptions in the same turn off of one card is great. Here's the thing about Terra Hertz that I think a lot of Rescue Ace players aren't considering. Is that, like, you summon Terra Hertz off of just one card. Like, you get the set four with Turbulence, then you go into Terra Hertz, all with just a single copy of Airlifter. Uh, assuming it goes completely uninterrupted, but once you get the turbulent set four, everything is icing on the cake. Once you get the turbulent set four, that's really all that you really need to play. You can keep you, you like half the time, unless your opponent opens a board breaker. It's very hard for them to pay to, to play through the four set. The, the 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 turbulent set four by itself, um, plus like shenanigans with like uh, floating with preventer and. Um, impulse and stuff like that, right? Getting the most use out of those two monsters that are left on the field is kind of like imperative because why not just get the most use out of like the two monsters that you still have on field, like the Hydrant and the Turbulence. And I think Terahertz is like the most value that you can get out of um, the standard airlifter combo because then you basically Terahertz threatens game if it goes 
completely uninterrupted. So now your opponent has to like divide their attention between dealing with terahertz and dealing with the set four back row. And that's not easy, right? Now there are some cards that make it look easy like Dinosaur or Pankatrops, right? That's that's a one card answer to terahertz. I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you that. But Pankatrops is at one, right? Like it's it's not like the perfect answer. Fenrir doesn't really deal with uh terahertz well because you have the back row. And Steven was even saying, it's like, you can kind of just play with Terahertz until they really start to um, threaten your board. And then you start to um, summon out your, like, you can leave, like, your board empty and nothing with nothing but Terahertz. And then Terahertz can kind of, like, play around with what the opponent does. And then you, and then if they have the extra um, cards, that's when you start to rescue, bring back your Hydrant or bring back your Airlifter. And then you start to play with your sets. If you're facing in the mirror match, right, a lot of people are, are, are on Rescue Ace. Some people might be on cards like Super Poly. So they can't Super Poly you if the only monster on your field is Terahertz. It's really hard for them to Super Poly you <laughs> if, if that's the case. So now they kind of have to play around to Terahertz properly. They can't Book and Moon it. They, can, they, they can't they can Econ it because Econ requires them to use at least, um, because we have the Disaborum interruption in engrave it's like yeah terahertz provides a lot of like utility for a deck and steven still likes the long way of going about it there is a shorter way to summon terahertz if you feel like you need more cards in your extra deck but if you need more slots in your extra deck first off you can take out an an uh, sp little knight because you don't need to, <laughs> like i know people love playing two i don't think you need two of them but like i can understand why people love playing two because it just does so much and rescue doesn't really recur um, non rescue ace cards pretty well so um, having the second one always there kind of like it, it's kind of like when I was playing Earth Machine and people were on double Anger Knuckle like the Anger Knuckle isn't there because like you could recur the Anger Knuckle but it's j it just feels a lot better to always have that second one in the extract just to know that you can deal with a situation without having to um, beat around the bush you know the longer combo for the terahertz really the only benefit over playing it over playing the shorter combo is that you get the firewall add back. You also get to more situations where it's like, if you get interrupted halfway th through the uh, regular version, you could still potentially end on firewall plus a link that points to it, like plus the pr protect code talker. Whereas like if you get interrupted on the shorter terahertz combo, you end on like a G golem crystal heart, you know, which doesn't really do much, right? So it's kind of like give and take. I personally like the shorter version just cause I feel like it has more utility. The longer version, you have to keep all those cards in your extra deck. So a card like Prosperity wasn't as strong because now it's like Prosperity. It's like you don't want to banish your entire Terahertz combo. Oftentimes, I like Prosperity only for three because I was like, well, if I if I go for six, then I have to banish some of this combo, but I want to keep this combo in my extra deck. It was a very like risky kind of thing to play Prosperity and to play the longer um, terahertz build so that's why I switched to the shorter one now I have more extra deck versatility I can play cards like dark and Celine and in, in, in my list I do still play sunlight wolf I do have two SB little knights I do still play IP um, stellar nemesis I I never thought any of the puzzle Mino combos were good uh, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you I think like those are the most like we those actually lose to nip because if you crutch your deck on, hey, I have to resolve Puzzle Mino, I understand I like it's still icing on the cake, but like Nib just kills it. Like straight up. You will never be able to use any of those cards in your extra deck ever again. Whereas like if they nib you on like binary sorceress, if you can still make a G Golem Crystal Heart, you can still go for something like um, Axis Code turn three. Whereas um with Puzzle Mino builds, it's just like one imperm, it's like or like if they have another imperm, it's like good luck, you know, like GG's. Um, I also don't think summoning Ibli is as strong unless you open a card like Spellbound. And Spellbound against Pearly, kind of great, right? Spellbound uh, going into certain matchups is cool. Um, he said he never summons Cowboy, which again, I d I just don't, I just have no faith in rank fours in Rescue Ace unless you're on something like Super Heavy. Because otherwise, like, how the fuck are you summoning this card? Like, be like, be realistic with me. Like, man to man, how the fuck are you summoning Gaga and Cowboy in your deck uh, without like really sacrificing some of your um, potential combo lines just to make damage on board? You know. Also, 
uh, cool thing to note, the fire attacker in the side deck. It's because he was saying um, impulse is still great at three. And there are some matchups where if you just go for fire engine, you don't really get that. Um, they can kind of just break the fire engine and whatever rest grace you summoned um, down before you get to play your turn. So sometimes it's better just to get the fire attacker and get like the, the, the plus one in hand. So that you're not... Like just to go two cards deeper in your deck so that you're not like losing out if fire attacker leaves the field. Unlike uh, with fire engine, you know? And yeah, like it gives you the extra cards you need to potentially play, uh, break boards and play around things, so. But I'm really in love with like how Steven has played uh, piloted Rescue Ace so far, and this is definitely one of my personal favorite builds I've seen of Rescue Ace since the deck has come out. So I'm loving uh, the fact that the, the Cyburst Link Climb is still one of the best variants and the fact that Steven is still seeing a lot of success with it. So top 16, we see more Horus tier limits. This guy's only on a single King Sarcophagus. He just said, fuck the rules. I have triple Imcity. Imcity also went crazy up in price. This guy isn't on the rank six, but again, I guess tier, tier players only care about milling. They're only going for zombie vampire. And he's also on more of the card destruction. Uh, last guy was not on Foolish Burial Goods or card destruction. This guy's on Foolish Burial Goods and he has more copies of like Suliac and, and stuff in this list, so it's easier for him. Again, still no barricade board blocker to revive the King Sarcophagus from Graveyard during end phase in case it gets milled or something, but hey, you know, all the more power to him. Also, Scattershot inside, Triple Exceed Encore. I guess they really just don't like Pearly. And it's like, Pearly is like the most sided against deck. Like, I, I think like in the whole format, because I'm seeing like every, every list here is siding against Pearly so heavily. Maybe except this guy. This guy doesn't seem to care too much about Pearly. Um, but he already has the Super Polys in main and stuff. And this this guy's a Pearly player. So, But, like, look at this. The, the cross out with the Pearly. The uh, triple tactic stressed with the Herald of the Abyss. The mistaken arrest. The, the thrust into the Abyss. It's like, man, people just really don't like playing against Pearly. <laughs> like, at all. And here we go. Elias Serogianis. Uh, made top 32 with uh, Cash Jira. He's, he's a New York player, so. And he, he's also a former Earth Machine player, so that's why I know who this guy is. If you watch his deck profile on the Ground Game channel, you're going to see that uh, he has this really interesting theory of one ofs. So basically, his, his idea is by playing one ofs of, of a lot of different cards, you increase the variety of what your deck can do. And you basically play one ofs of a lot of strong different cards, and you play a card like Prosperity where it can dig a lot deeper into your deck, especially when going second. And you kind of get to like pick and choose which one you need when you need it. Making his deck effectively a really strong toolbox deck. And we, we don't see a lot of toolbox main decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! anymore because most people are on like triple copies of this, triple copies of that. And they don't really play a lot of cards that are like this card for this situation, this card for this situation, this card for this situation. They kind of go more like, okay, let me have a card that deals with as many situations as possible and kind of just outplay my opponent with that, right? Elias over here has like a sort of like opposite idea where instead of tripling out on everything that like deals with as many things as possible, you play single copies of cards that have a lot of varied use and can deal with multiple situations. So, so now you have access to more cards that can deal with more things. And then with uh, triple tactic stress as well, you know, it, it helps you, you know, talents thrust, you know, they dig you deeper into your deck as well for evenly and, and stuff like that. And another interesting thing is that he's also on Odd Ice Absolute Dragon. So Odd Ice Absolute goes, when it's uh, sent to the grave, you link it off for gravity controller, it gets to summon Odd Eyes Rebellion, and then Odd Eyes Rebellion gets to Odd Eyes Rebellion Overlord gets to Chaos Exceeds over the regular one, overlaid on top, and then it gets to make three attacks per turn, and it's at 3,000 attack, which is effectively like 9k damage total because you have the, the OG Rebellion as material. Effectively, like he can kind of just OTK with a single Fenrir. I don't think Kashdura players were on that before. But now it's like, if he can like pull off one of these fringe cards, like an Econ or something, and then like special, special Fenrir, normal Rise Heart, and then link off into, and then make absolute link off into gravity controller, that's game. Like you just lost. <laughs> and it's really funny to see like now how innovative, you know, Cash Dira has gotten. I think like losing a Rise Heart might've been a really good thing. Cause now we get to see like how, like what the deck can really do now. 
Now that they're not just sitting on that stupid ass boss monster, we get to see what Vet can really do. And yes, Shifter is still a card, and Shifter can steal games because some decks just cannot play through Shifter, but Shifter is not the only reason why the deck can win. The Kashira cards are still pretty broken, and they, they can still do a lot. They still have a lot of recursion. They can still play low to the ground and leave big bodies on board that's that's kind of hard to deal with. Multiple big bodies on board that's that's hard to deal with. And really, it's like as long as like you can open something like a Solemn or like an Anti-Spell, it's going to be really hard for your opponents to actually play through and break your board if, if you have like a decent opening. Or, or even going second, it's really easy for you to handle um, a lot of interruptions because anytime, like let's say like uh, Kashira gets negated and destroyed, you can restart with a Unicorn and then grab Theosis, go into Ogre or um, another friend beer, you know, that, <laughs> uh, that didn't get to uh, use its Spanish effect yet. So it's a really interesting list. Um, I definitely go uh, suggest going to Ground Game. I'll, I'll leave a link in, in the description to the video, to the deck profile, so you guys can check it out for yourself. And then we have Makanko, and we see here yet another deck that benefits greatly off of the Simple Spoils package existing. Also utilizing the Ken and Gen techniques. Uh, also utilizing Geonator Transverser with uh, Acid Golem, because now you're leaving a monster on their field with like Ken and Gen, you get to summon your own uh, Acid Golem and then swap it to the opponent's side of the field and then your opponent cannot special summon while this while they control this card. Meaning they kind of have to deal with this, they kind of have to s somehow get rid of this Acid Golem without special summoning. They can't link it off, they... I don't know if they can tribute summon with it, but even then, like leaving a nuisance on their field kind of for free is still really good. And then you can still go into stuff like Esold, uh, mill your equips, and uh, I, I think I went over in my last discussion video about McConco topping, about how strong Esold is when it gets to mill your equips, because your equips in Grave, you know, especially this um, Mayawashi Dori, or whatever it's called, gets to just banish itself and summon a McConco from Grave. Um, so even if Esold doesn't resolve, you still get value from it sending equips from deck to Graveyard. And Makonko really does not need too many Makonko cards to be a, a solid Makonko deck. You really just need Huli, um, Hare, and Ohime. And you're able to just play the game, you know? Um, change of Heart to steal the um, Ken or Gen that you summon to your opponent's field. So basically you get both effects for both the Ken and the Gen. And then you get to Overlay. Or you get to Link into Yisold. So it's really, really smart. Simple Spoils can only summon Fireflint or Renaud, but the fact that you can go for either one is great. Both of these cards are really helpful for the deck just for like link climbing and, and, and stuff. And then Super Poly works really great here because you already have Warriors. A, a Super Poly in, into Guilty Gear Freed, I, I, I think could really work out for you. And then you can link off your Guilty Gear Freed because it's it's still a warrior that you can, you can use. Or you can leave it on field because um, it negates cards that target it. I believe it negates monster effects that target it. I don't know if it's monster spell or trap, but it's it's one of those two. And you know, they still have Mud Dragon plus Garua. I feel like if you're gonna play Mud Dragon for Super Poly, you could still play Instant Fusion just to make sure Mud Dragon comes out. But hey, maybe that's just me. They are playing Angelic Ring in the side deck. Angelic Ring is great for um, interrupting cards like Dark Ruin no more. But Angelic Ring has to negate the first spell that they activate. So if they read this card, they will know how to play around it, assuming that they that they um, have an extra spell card to, to waste. But, yeah. Also, Lava Golem, it doesn't seem like this deck needs its normal summon, unless you open Ken and Gen. That's probably why these cards fit so well in, into the archetype, because these give the deck the best normal summon that it could have ever gotten. Just be real careful about playing these cards game one, if you don't know what your opponent's on, because <laughs> imagine, you know, you go against like Dark World or Tear and you're helping them discard cards, that would be terrible. But otherwise, yeah, looks pretty solid. And Makanko, I don't think enough people put respect on this deck. I think um, this deck's going to persist in the format. I don't see anything in this deck really getting hit. Maybe other than Ken and Gen. But I don't see anything on this list getting hit. Um, also, signing again, Pearly. Pearly is like the biggest... Most people probably learn how to play around Rescue Ace. But most people hate... Like, it seems like most people hate on Pearly the most. In terms of, like, sighting patterns. It feels like that is a card specifically for Pearly. Or for Zeus, I guess, you know, if you want to play around a Zeus. 
Right, so we got more tournaments. Uh, Fenrir is in main. You got Right Self here. No card destruction, but Foolish Burial Goods. We're seeing Dweller. I don't think the other ones were on Dweller. We're seeing Scattershot. We're still seeing Exceed Encore. People hate Pearly. <laughs> People hate Exceed Monsters. It's great. Otherwise, the list looks pretty sander. Only one Diviner. And no Baron. No Baron, actually. That's that's That, that was the one thing. There's no Baron, no Distrudo, no... So he's not relying on Diviner being used for Synchro Package. Probably just wants Diviner to be a good level 8. I'm uh, Not level 8. Level 6. The other two were Horus. This one is not Horus. Yeah, so top 16 and top... Top eight were Horus. This guy is just regular tier. No, no, no Horus package. And last but not least, Solid Mangrate made it to top 32. And if you look at this list, it like it doesn't look like anything spectacular is going on here. It just looks like wow, you're just playing Salad. Like why are you playing Salad? You know. And I think Salad is really capable. I think any Cyber deck is capable, but Salad has been like one of the best just because of its ability to recur its own resources. It really, it's like really straightforward game plan. It can play lows to the ground with uh, Sunlight Wolf plus Roar. It can play um, Floodgates like Gozen plus Rivalry. It can have really great recursion off Fire Recovery. It has great consistency. Gazelle circles at three. You don't even need to play Sign at Mining and Buffalo being able to dig you two cards deeper into your deck. I'm not too familiar with the new ones. Uh, Salmanger to Fire, or like Great Pyro, or Great Fire, Great Pyro Phoenix, I don't know what, what it's called, but I know that they do pretty well for the deck, and that's why they cost so they cost so much, but otherwise, other than these two new Salmanger cards, this is a very budget deck. This is an extremely budget deck, and um, fire, fire Recovery not being once per turn is great too, because like you get to just summon... If you open multiple of these, they're not dead in hand. You get to keep on summoning fire monsters back from the graveyard. So definitely a strategy that I don't think many people expect. And it could probably like blow the opponent out. Like, you know, if if the opponent doesn't know how to play around it. Um, also, I really like the extra copies that goes in the rivalry inside. So that if the opponent knows like, hey, my opponent's deck can't play good into rivalry. Like... If, if he's playing against Rescue Ways, the Rescue Ways can, can play well into Gozen. They can play well into Rivalry, though. Side out the Gozen to put in the Rivalry. Also, Dweller. Still found space for Dweller. Like, this is the only, like, non cybers card in, the in like, the extra deck. Just for, like, tier matchups and, like, Unchained, uh, I'm assuming. I know Mirage Stelio, it doesn't lock into Fire. It just says you can't activate non-Fire Monster effects for us to turn. You can still summon non-Fire Monsters. Just, you just can't use their effects. But just about everything else in the deck is Fire besides Droll and like hand traps so that's not even gonna come up that much really solid looking list uh happy saw man great is still here um doing big things i think code talker could easily be here if someone wanted to play code talker this format they could easily do it um i'm a very big code talker fan so i'm happy to see something cybers make it to the top of the uh ladder and labyrinth i can't pr pretend like i know what labyrinth has going on here but um one thing I found interesting is that um, the people starting to play Red Dog. And the reason why that's so interesting to me is because, like, I didn't think that was a thing. Like, you got Escape of the Unchained, Red Dog, and then Triple Butler now. So, I don't know if Labyrinth is becoming more of a, like, pseudo mid-range combo deck where, although it still plays control, it, it, like, starts to combo off a bit more. And it's kind of funny, like... They're playing triple extra, and you can see where their priorities are. Like, they want Yama to stay in their extra deck. They don't care too much about SB Little Knight. If it gets banished, it gets banished. <laughs> if Muckraker gets banished, it gets banished. And it's like, the fact that they're prioritizing this Unchained stuff over Muckraker is, like, insane to me. Because I thought Muckraker is, like, the best card in the deck. Or the best card in the extra deck for, um, Labyrinth. But I guess not anymore. I guess this Unchained stuff has a little more merit to it. So, that's kind of interesting. But I can't pretend like I know what... what anything else that's going on here because i i know absolute shit about labyrinth but kind of cool uh that they can play a lot of single one-off traps uh karma cannon's great terror terror's under root still a great underrated trap card discard does can destroy so many strategies if it actually fucking resolves and uh i'm just interested to see where, where else uh butler can can uh, help carry this deck also kind of surprised i didn't think they played both servants I thought it was only Ariana, but now I guess the second servant has some purpose now. So, good to see. Good stuff from Labyrinth. Um, so yeah, that has been Yu-Gi-Oh! Post-Age of Overlord. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. 
Uh, what deck do you are, are you guys planning to pilot this format? What decks are are you guys surprised aren't doing as well? What decks are you guys surprised did do well? And um, how are you guys feeling about this uh, this this new deck count um, thing that's going on? You know, most people being over forty now. You know, with the uh, uh, amount of things that you have to uh, account for in the format, over forty seems to be the new way to play Yu-Gi-Oh. This has been your boy Nistro here, signing out.